Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for May 12th, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. I am joined once again by Somerville City Council President Matt McLaughlin, and he is bringing a very special guest with him today, Dr. Emily Ackman, who is the school committee person from Ward 1. Um, Ward 1, I get a two for today. Matt McLaughlin, the representative from Ward 1, and uh, Dr. Emily Ackman. Emily, good to see you again. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing pretty well this morning. I was able to get outside with my kids in the nicer weather. Uh, you know, even with masks on makes it really nice. Yeah, so we're, go we're gonna make Matt feel bad today that he, he doesn't have two children that he has to worry about yet. It's so terrible, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm so glad that we have uh, both representatives from Ward 1. We can kind of make this uh, a Ward 1 centric. But as usual, what we do, Emily, is we let Matt uh, take over the first part of this because, uh, as you know, public health and public safety is a central, uh, a central theme in the city of Somerville these days and across the United States. And Matt, as president of the council, uh, oversees uh, one of the committees, which is public health, public safety. So Matt, if you don't mind, if we can have an update from your latest. Thanks, Joe. And as you mentioned, uh, we have a public health and safety meeting every Monday, so I'm always happy to report on Tuesday what we just uh, discuss. Uh, and a lot of this information can also be found on the City of Somerville website at somervillema.gov. Uh, as of today, uh, there have been 600, 712 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Somerville. 384 have recovered and there have been 17 deaths. Uh, we recently discussed uh, a quarantine at 70 Perkins Street, which is in Mount Pleasant Senior Apartments. Uh, that quarantine has been lifted. Uh, there were 20 cases of COVID-19 there, and unfortunately there was one death. Uh, but they, the quarantine has been lifted, so they believe that uh, the, the initial scare there is over with. Um, as people know, uh, the mask requirement in Somerville and in the state of Massachusetts is in effect. And in some of them, there's a $300 ticket associated with uh, not complying with this order. Uh, we had the chief of police, uh, Chief Fallon, at a uh, public health and safety meeting yesterday to discuss this and to discuss enforcement and make sure that, you know, people are treated equitably and fairly uh, with mask enforcement. Uh, as of today, it's been, a, it's been almost a full week and they have issued no tickets uh, for the mask law. And we had a thorough discussion about that. And, the way I told, the way I felt is, you know, the officers have to use discretion to issue these tickets, and hopefully, we'll only issue them when someone is just absolutely refusing to comply. And that seemed to be the chief's opinion as well. Uh, he said they're looking for voluntary compliance with this mask order. They're not trying to uh, be hard on this. They're just looking out for people's public health and safety. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, anybody in the city of Somerville can get tested uh, for COVID-19 uh, from the Somerville Hospital. They have now opened up three locations, one of them at the East Somerville School. Uh, people are asked to call in advance. Uh, you can get this test regardless of if you have symptoms. Uh, and you can call 617-665-2928 uh, between Monday and Friday at between 8.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. So I encourage anybody who wants to get tested to get tested. Uh, the city is also going to be issuing, we recently got over 100,000 masks to give to residents. Um, and the Somerville Police Office will be, they'll be distributing masks from 9 to 10 a.m. and 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, at these locations, at the East Somerville Police substation at 81 Broadway. Uh, and that'll be outside, but it'll be inside if it rains out. Uh, the Broadway and Temple Street Police Public Safety Building on 220 Washington Street. Uh, that's the main police station. And there's police substation at 116 Broadway. So I'll just repeat that again. Between 9 and 10 a.m. and 4 and 5 p.m., you can get a free mask at 81 Broadway, 220 Washington Street, or 1116 1, Broadway. And then finally, uh, people may have saw that uh, the city is now, first of all, we're pl the planned opening is May 18th, and people should expect a possible pushback on that, uh, as we've had that, we've had dates before and it's got pushed back, but it's May 12th now, and as of right now, we've had no updates uh, pushing it back further, so the opening date is May 18th for 
street cleaning, uh, as well as construction. Uh, there's going to be a phased reintroduction of construction uh, that you can find the details of that on the city's website. And we'll see if city buildings open at that time too. And of course, the schools are closed uh, for the year. Uh, so that's all I have, Joe. Matt, let me ask you a couple of questions before we go over to Emily Ackman. On the mask distribution, that's assuming that people can get to these places. Are there any plans in the city through public health or through the city side itself to distribute masks to our seniors, to our shut-ins, uh, and those folks who cannot get to these predetermined locations? Yes, they're, they're doing that as well. They're giving masks to all the senior homes as well as uh, the affordable housing units. Uh, so that is uh, in the works as well. And this is just for the general public if you're not able to get a mask. And if you, um, let me see, I don't have a contact info for that, but I, I do believe if you, you contacted the city's public health department, uh, they can direct you to finding a mask. And again, if you can look at all this on uh, someofma.gov and there's okay. a coronavirus link. Okay, and I assume they can always call 311 to get some kind of direction. And as always, they can give us a call, um, you know, contact any of us at the media center. We'll try to find an answer for them. On the testing, Matt, are you getting a sense from Director Doug Cress here in Somerville on the public health side of things? It is, does he feel as though the number of people that are being tested in Somerville is satisfactory? Or are we behind the curve? Are we ahead of it in terms of how fast he wants to see people being tested? Well, I'd, I'd say we're ahead of the national curve and behind on the overall curve, because as we've discussed before, ideally everybody in the country would get tested. And right now, the city of Somerville has the ability to test anybody who wants to get tested, uh, but it is voluntary and it is limited. Hopefully we don't run out of tests, but uh, this should have been something that happened a month ago. So we're, we're fortunate to be ahead of the on the national curve, but I wouldn't mock that as a victory yet either. And I would say, you know, they gave us an update on the tests last night, and we did find that uh, by, it's broken up by zip code 02145, which is East Somerville, the Winter Hill area, uh, has disproportionately higher level of uh, confirmed cases. And that goes with all the discussions we've had about uh, how this impacts class and race and just different things like that. Uh, so we're, we're following the data, showing where people are getting sick, uh, but it is also ideally everybody would get tested in the country. And, and specifically, Matt, are they able to pinpoint by the data that they're collecting here locally that the hotspot, uh, my term, not yours, but the hotspot seems to be in that uh, Winter Hill, you know, 02145, Winter Hill, certain parts of Spring Hill. Are they able to pinpoint whether those are coming out of um, housing developments or are they scattered all over the place or are they coming from uh, senior living homes? I mean, uh, they must be able to tell whether these are individual cases or are they coming from congregate housing? Well, the, the information we were given was broken up by zip code, so I can't tell you if it's uh, disproportionate because of senior buildings or anything, but I will say that I expected the numbers to be higher on the east side because where um, there's a little bit more working class people in the community, there's a lot of immigrants in the community, and it's also the densest, the most dense populated area in the city, which is already the most densely populated city in New England. So there's a number of factors, and I would just add to that, uh, although we have a disproportionate amount, that's you know 30 cases as opposed to 10, 15. So we can't give on other parts of the city. So we can't give a scientific explanation for it or tell you exactly that this side is worse than the other. But I, I did ask, a senior asked me once uh, if they could identify specific places where people have gotten sick. And I told him, you know, the assumption should be that it's everywhere. Uh, it's spread all over right. the planet. So you shouldn't expect that, you know, East Somerville is safe and West Somerville is not safe. Uh, you, the assumption should be that it's everywhere. Right. No, thanks for the update, Matt. And I just wanted to call attention. I asked you specifically the question about testing because it really is disheartening when we look at dig, those of us who love numbers, you dig down into the numbers, only 2% of the population of this country has been tested. 2%, that's disgraceful. 
Um, so I kind of look at, you know, okay, Massachusetts, how are you doing in testing? Somerville, how are you doing in testing? Um, but more to come on that. Unfortunately for Massachusetts, we did pass that milestone, Matt, since we last spoke. We now have over 5,000 deaths in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the number has jumped uh, since we last spoke to 17 deaths here in Somerville. And just remember that sometimes that is a function of the number of tests that we've done, people who develop uh, or severe symptoms over a period of 14 days and then are hospitalized. And sometimes, unfortunately, it's too late by the time they get in to a hospital. So, Emily, I'm going to ask you the major question of the day. What made you agree to come on this show with Matt McLaughlin? Uh, I was a little blindsided. It, I was asking Matt if anyone from the schools was coming, and he said, you can do it. Uh, so, but I know that you are speaking with uh, Mary Skipper, the superintendent, and Carrie Norman, the chair of the school committee tomorrow. Um, so, you know, you'll, you'll get even, even better information than I can offer. But I think it's, it's terrific for um, you as a working mom and an elected representative that you can add some empathy uh, when you're speaking about being at home with kids. Uh, worried about the education system, not only for your own children, but for the children of Somerville. So in a general sense, Emily, what are you feeling as a mom being home with kids and knowing that their education has been so severely disrupted at this point? Uh, I Well, to that point of the education disruption, I feel fortunate because my kids are three and four, so they haven't yet hit the public school system where there's curriculum and standard and ex expectations. There are early education curriculums, but they're all optional. Um, my kids are at the Elizabeth Peabody House, a wonderful uh, organization, and the schooling they're getting there is great, but it, you know, there aren't expectations by end of grade. And so for me, I actually, in that realm, feel incredibly fortunate. Um, I am worried you know, about my 5,000 other kids, all the kids in the Somerville Public Schools, um, we have been fairly fortunate in that sort of in the K-5 uh, realm, most of what students are going to learn for the academic year have been taught, and the final third to quarter of the academic year is usually reteaching. Um, we focus on what is called, or the district focuses, they call them on power standards, or at least I think that's what you're going to hear when Mary talks about it. And those are the standards um, that, you know, really show that they're ready to go to the next grade. Um, and, you know, for sixth through 12th grade, that is the larger fear because there is new knowledge um, that those kids are not going to have. Uh, so that's, to me, you know, I, I hope I addressed your question. Those are, you know, as a, as a mom, it um, is mostly exhausting. There are some things that are really nice because I've never gotten this much time with my kids and I probably never will once it's behind us. Um, and, you know, but I, there's a lot of social growth that they're not getting. And um, I know that they miss their teachers and their friends. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is extremely, speaking of children, there you are, Emily. They heard you talking about them, so they're going to make their presence known. They're, and you they're know, actually I, fighting I, downstairs right now. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell you, if they wander into the scene, we're going to stay on them. We're going to ask them questions about how's As mom you should. doing these days. <laughs> um, so back to the education side of it. I know that... Um, Nationally, we're struggling with how do we resume the education system. Statewide, I know Governor Baker is gonna be talking about it at some point, and I thought it was advantageous for us, and um, Mary Skipper and Carrie Norman, chair of the school committee, have both said, yeah, we've gotta start talking about this. Um, one of the things, though, I wanted to address, so I won't forget it, is, um, and I've been told, 
you may or may not know, we have a Somerville school teacher on our board of directors of the Somerville Media Center. And I did that I purposely, didn't know that. Because, purposely because one of, our, um, one of our community partners is the Somerville education system. Right. So um, she mentioned at the board meeting last night that she wanted to see from me our commitment to these kids that have moving forward ceremonies. I guess we're not supposed to call them graduation ceremonies. They're moving forward ceremonies because it's not only for the senior high school kids. The, uh, I was unaware that each school has end of year ceremonies that they, the kids who are moving on, either they're going into you know, the middle school per se, or they're moving on to the high school. They have congratulatory ceremonies for them. Mm -hmm. Has that come up during the summer, uh, during the school committee virtual meetings that you've been having? And what's the status on that? So it has come up. Um, it is one of those things that is TBD. Um, what you know, what you speak to is one of the reasons that June is such a busy month when you're on the school committee because we do try and get at least two or three members at every ceremony, um, including all of the moving on ceremonies. Um, and so uh, I know that there are plans. I think it's in consult with each of the principals and what they think is best for their student population. Um, I don't know more than that. I would love to see SMC being involved, though. That would be really wonderful, and I know it would be meaningful. Emily, you know Carrie Normand and Mary Skipper better than I do. If you watch the show tomorrow, I'm sure that the two of them are going to pin me down about supporting these, these programs going forward. And we already, you know, we discussed it um, at our board meeting last night, and we've mm -hmm. made the commitment that we're going to do everything we can Thank to you. help all of these kids when they move on to the next level. So, um, Matt, I, Matt and Emily, I want to ask you both a question about the governor's uh, reopening advisory. Um, he's put this commission together. Uh, one of the things that was seriously, uh, well, one of the things that came to my attention that I think is a serious flaw is not having members of the teachers unions or the teachers uh, representatives on that advisory committee. In addition, it was shocking to me that I didn't have anybody from the medical community either. Um, do either one of you want to talk about that? And then maybe Matt, if we can bring it to the local level and find out what the mayor is thinking and how the council is involved in a reopening plan. Well, I'd also add that I don't think anyone from labor period is involved in that committee. Uh, so that is concerning. Uh, and I hope they address that. I, I do think, you know, compared to other states, we're doing a pretty good job in terms of managing expectations and uh, taken this very seriously, but yeah, everybody should be at the table. Uh, so that's all I have on that. Did you have? A, did you want to comment, Emily, or did you have a question, Joe? Oh, I mean, the only thing I would say is that um, I, my brother lives in Denver, Colorado, and one of the things he told me is that probably two or three weeks ago, the governor there very explicitly said he was like, "I don't know what schooling is going to look like in the fall. I don't know if schools are going to open in the fall," and you know, Baker has done a wonderful job in a lot of ways, especially with the absence of federal leadership. But, you know, we, we haven't heard anything like that. And even, you know, just starting conversations about, you know, it's probably not going to look the same. It, that it seems to, and this will kick over to Matt, that it's, it's something we're having to say at the local level and there's no, you know, systematic message yet from the state um, that, you know, it's going to look different. We don't know how, but it's going to look different. Matt, on the, um, the city side, reopening advisory committee, board, whatever, is there anything in play right now about how to safely reopen certain businesses that are uh, non-essential? Yeah, so um, the, how do I answer this? So, they're, they're talking about the phase reopening of uh, construction. And again, you can find that on the website where they explain right in detail uh, what gets to open up first and prioritize and 
businesses that will be better off, be better able to handle um, small groups of people. So, so a business that doesn't have to deal with as many people will be open before a business that has to deal with a lot of people. Uh, other than that, you know, the city is updating us every week. I get updated twice a week or three times a week about status. Uh, most of the decisions, these are up to the mayor. So the mayor announced the uh, li lifting of restrictions for construction, uh, the streets we've been banned, things like this. So the council isn't necessarily involved in making those decisions, but we are involved in, uh, we are kept updated and give input all the time on uh, what should happen. And as of right now, I feel pretty good that, you know, we're keeping things closed as a necessity. And I'll be waiting to see what happens uh, come the 18th. Emily, th there's a double-edged sword here for you. You're a working mom. You've got two kids at home with you. They're usually in uh, daycare or pre-care. Um, and you're worried about them moving on to mm -hmm. the next level in the public education system. Mm -hmm. How st it's stressful, I understand, but what do you, what do you wanna see happen first? Do you wanna see businesses reopen, such as the daycare? that your kids go to and then um, you go back to work? Or I, I don't know how you actually manage that in your head. So it's, you know, it's interesting. You say part of my nine to five job, um, part of the reason I've been able to keep doing it is it, you know, has a strong remote working component. I'm very fortunate for that. But I've also had to drop down to part time at work. And again, my company is very supportive. Um, I've been able to keep full benefits while doing it because this is an unusual time. but you know, I will not be able to work at full capacity until that preschool is open. Um, and it, it is a business, it's a nonprofit to your point. Um, I think, you know, I, I think I would like to see more focus from the city, from the state, you know, the fact that schools and preschools are phase four and that Governor Baker has said, nothing more to the best of my knowledge than it's complicated um, does not give me a lot of hope. I understand it's not the greatest revenue generator. And right now, you know, we're at a huge loss for tax revenue. Um, so I, I understand focusing on other things, but at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to get back to anything that resembles normal life until childcare is provided for. Um, and that includes, you know, I say childcare, but that's, my kids are little, but you know, summer programs, things like that. Like right, you, right. if those all have to be remote over the summer, um, those parents are not going to be able to, to be working at full capacity. Right. It's something, Emily, I, I, I wanted to ask you directly because you are a parent of young children and it's something that, uh, we've been wrestling with at the media center as well. As you know, we have a robust summer school program, kids coming in learning media, um, and we did have to make the painful decision that without any rock solid protocols on how we reopen that center to the public, especially young kids, um, we have made the painful decision that we will go virtual for the entire summer. And, and in, in only Joe Lynch vernacular, it sucks. Yeah. because the kids are the ones that are going to suffer in this. We adults will be able to figure it out. We'll be able to move forward. We'll be able to provide programs, but it's not going to be the same for those kids that we're looking forward to summer camp at Union Square. So, um, Matt, if I can just go back to one thing about uh, you had mentioned on the financial aspect or Emily alluded to the financial aspect, the budget season is coming up next month. How painful is this going to be, both from the city side and from the school district side? So we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, and hopefully it, hopefully it won't be that painful this year uh, because we do have a surplus of revenue uh, to keep the government going. Uh, so I'm hoping that we don't have to deal with really draconian cuts uh, but this is a very serious situation we're in right now. Uh, we're going to lose about 20% of our revenue from the state. So that's about $6 million lost right off the bat. 
And then that's not even including any of the revenue that we get from businesses, from property tax, from tickets. Uh, basically, every form of revenue the city has is going to be affected. So we're hoping you to get some support from the federal government. Sounds like we're going to expect less support from the state. And we're going to try to uh, use the surplus we have to try to keep things as steady as possible. But I can't make any guarantees on that. And that's something we've discussed in the school committee, uh, as well as the city council, is the fact that it's so uncertain right now. Uh, we're not even sure if we'll have a full year's budget this year. So we might have to do it month to month or uh, several months at a time. Hopefully we have a full annual budget. But the level of uncertainty is really high and that's, you know, people don't want to hear that, uh, but that is the fact of the matter. That's the situation right now is we have to see how much revenue we have and what we can afford. And hopefully it isn't a uh, serious impact on the employees and the city at some level. Yeah, Emily, on the school side, teachers, um, some of the best people I know on the face of the earth, how are they going to deal with if the school committee has to say to them, I'm sorry, these are the different things that are going to have to go for the next academic year? I think it's going to be really hard. You know, every budget season, one of the things that I have advocated for is more teachers and smaller class sizes. One of the things um, that I wish we'd focus on in our budget is, is lower student to teacher ratios. My concern is that we already have very high student to teacher ratios. You know, if, if the state limit is 22 uh, students for a first grade class or a second grade class, we hit that in almost all of the schools. Um, and so, we run a very lean budget. There's not a lot to cut before you start cutting things that people deem essential. We are committed to paying uh, our teachers through the end of this year, um, which I know is just till the end of next month. And then, you know, letting everyone know in as transparent a way as possible if changes need to be made, uh, you know, how, how those decisions are being made. Well, I think both of you um, have put it correctly that without knowing uh, what the federal government and the state government is going to do, it's very, very difficult for the municipalities to properly plan. Matt, did I miss any part? We have about 30 seconds left. Did I miss any part of the agenda that you wanted to talk about today? No, just on that last point, though, is that is one of the big problems. We all know about the problems with the federal government, but on the state level, we're awaiting a lot of guidance, both for our, the city's annual budget as well as the opening of the school year. Okay. Um, and these are difficult decisions to be made, so I understand, but people, re we really need to get that information. And, and I feel like, you know, the state, the federal government's telling the states to do it, and the state is telling the cities to do it. Uh, but we need some top down leadership at some point. Well, we're going to stay with you guys, both on the city side and the school committee side. For the Somerville Media Center, I want to thank our guest, President uh, McLaughlin, Somerville City Councilor, Dr. Emily Ackman from the Somerville School Committee, Ward 1. Thank you both. Until next time, stay safe, stay informed.